Good to see all of you here tonight. Let's respond strongly in worship in many different ways. Prayer, singing, a uh, uh, receiving of the word, hitting the joy baskets. And we will take a holy meal together before we leave. Make sure you keep your bulletin handy. It will be, uh, we're going to have a time of reflection when we're done here. So um, you can walk through some things in there, but there's not, the notes don't go along with the talk. They are for the reflection time. So uh, just make sure you have it close to you. If you don't have one, I'm sure that uh, some folks in the lobby would be happy to get you one. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 if you have a Bible with you. Uh, I've been uh, wanting to preach this sermon for about three years now, and God said, no, not yet. Uh, but now's the night, so it's a good night to be here, hopefully, for you. Uh, and if you've been around me for more than about six minutes, <laughs> you know that I have a seething hate most of the time righteous, sometimes highly unrighteous, I may even start swearing sometimes, about the prosperity gospel. And um, the prosperity gospel grips the hearts and minds of many people in our nation, and the crying shame of it is that we've exported it across the world. And so, tonight I want to, I want to redeem the word. The the. the uh, terrible thing about the gross misteaching of the prosperity gospel is that God actually does want to prosper his people. He has promised, promised to provide and to give more and more and more of himself to the faithful. That is guaranteed in scripture, sealed, you can count on it. But let me settle this real quickly for you. You and I do not get to determine what the prosperity looks like. Let me say that to you again. There's the difference between correct prosperity teaching and what is out there in the world. You and I do not get to, to determine what the prosperity looks like. See, the bad teaching teaches that you have some control. That God is your cosmic genie and that you can speak your desires into existence. Like your words have faith and force behind them, like your thoughts have abilities. It, they even teach that you can bribe God financially. I mean, think about that sometime. <laughs> the good teaching is that a good father knows what you need. And more than that, well, um, he knows what will reveal his glory in his story, in his way. And you know what? you get to come along for the ride. In the middle of him revealing his glory to the world, you get to come along for the ride. That is prosperity. That is a better day than any day you ever had as a son of Satan sinner. Flat up. Okay, rant over. Here is my, here is my prosperity sermon. Gutsy people, really gutsy people, face and step into emotional pain. <laughs> Looks full of prosperity, right? What? I posted that recently on social media. Social media cracks me up. So like if you, if you post a picture of a puppy, a new puppy licking the face of a new baby, you get like 7 million likes, right? You post that, I got six likes on that. I got three likes from people who like everything. Everybody's got that friend, right? No matter what you post, no matter what you post, bam! That thing gets liked. And then three biblical counselors liked it. Six people. One of the most important things we'll ever hear in our life. And here's the reality, though. When some straight, unsettling truth comes out, crickets on social media. Let me put it up again. You'll see how it, you're going to see it a few times. Gutsy people, really gutsy people, face and step into emotional pain. Because here's what we're going to do tonight. Everybody always wants to get practical. We're going to get real practical tonight. Permanent health. Not a moment of health. See, when you, when you see the new puppy licking the face of the baby, that feels good for about 30 seconds. Maybe five. But there's no permanent health in the way it makes you feel. If you were discouraged when you flipped on that picture, 30 seconds later, you're going to be discouraged again. Because there's no permanent health there. It's the same way if you get drunk to survive a really wicked problem. 
When you wake up in the morning, the really wicked problem is still there. You just have a headache to go along with it. Yes? Am I the only one that's ever tried that? What, 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 I can't get an amen? I'm the only soother here, huh? So a few weeks ago, Mark Sigma stood in this spot and preached what he called his best sermon ever from Exodus 13. For those of you that are not here, here's what he explained. He explained that the Israelites, who had been released from slavery, started across the Red Sea, were saved from the Egyptians in the Red Sea, got on the other side, and they knew there was a promised land awaiting them. But instead of sending them across the path of the Philistines, the direct route, he sent them on what? What was it? The long way around. Those of you who were here cannot forget those words. You may have tried to forget those words. But those are the words. He pointed out to us that God is sometimes not near as interested in the racing to the finished product as he is the process. He asked us some crazy questions, right? Like, would you receive pancreatic cancer if that was God's way to redeem and reveal glory in your life? He said, have you prayed the scary prayer? God, do whatever. Here's the, here's the, let me just say this. I, I was sitting there thinking when he said that. God's going to do whatever anyway. You can get in his game or you can try to fight him. He's going to do whatever anyway. So the prayer is, I'm ready to line my will with your will. And if that means something that doesn't look so prosperity, Mark's point was, then so be it, because he's taking us on the long way around sometimes. If you've not seen that, it's on the, City on a Hill Facebook page, it's on the YouTube pages. Josh can tell you how to get there. So God took these 1.5 million Israelites on the long way around. Well, when we pick up the sermon tonight, they have been on the long way around for a period of months. There's been a lot of things happen, mountains and Ten Commandments and golden calves and lots of insanity. And they've arrived at the promised land. They're standing on a ridge over the Jordan River as we start here in Numbers chapter 13, looking into the place, the destination of which God has said he would give them. So the God-ordained long way around was not 40 years. A lot of us read the Bible and we think that long way around that he initially sent them on was 40 years. No, it wasn't. It was a relatively short amount of time. Because they walk up to the promised land and and we take up tonight. He had taken them on a struggle. But right now, I want you to visualize this. They are staring into prosperity. They are staring into a flourishing. Do you have any interest in flourishing? I mean, really. In this room tonight, would you like to flourish? We all have definitions of flourish. See, that's a problem. You can't, you can't bring your definition of flourish in tonight, though. Because God wants to give you his definition of flourish. Let's take off. Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of the fathers, you send a man, every one of them, a chief among them. So, Bible study here. What did God audibly say to Moses about the land right there? I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you the land. Say that with me. I am giving you the land. One more time. I am giving you the land. All right, here's the deal. Here's the question. Promises of God. Do you believe them? We all say we believe in God. Do you believe the promises of God? That's really the key question here tonight as we look at what's about to happen here. Remember, and I want you to remember a couple of things about these people who are standing there right now, 1.5 million of them. They had never known anything except slavery and desert sand. They didn't know about anything good. They had never tasted wine. They had never had a, 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 a meal prepared that was out of stress. They had never known what it was like to um, work with joy. 
They had only known a whip in their back as they made bricks, and sometimes bricks with no straw. And then they got released into this fantastic wilderness called a desert on the long way around. So they had never known flourish. They'd never known good crops, wine, their own home that was relaxed, peace. Never known a day of peace. You interested in a day of peace? Those of you that have kids, interested in a day of peace? And here it all was laid out right before them. Skip uh, down with me to verse 17. Moses does what he was told. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go into the Negev and up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now it was the time of the season of first ripe grapes. I like good ripe grapes. So God has sent them to spy the land, to test them, because he knew what they would find. It wasn't like God needed a search party to go out and come back and tell him about what the land was like. Everybody digs that, right? God, God didn't need a report. Don't give me a book report. And remember this, everyone, listen, this is for you, who looks into their personal promised land finds the same thing that they found. Okay? As you're trying to think, well, what does this have to do with me tonight? I want you to think about that. Every one of you, as you look into your flourish, as you look into your promised land, I want you to realize that what they find when they go spy is in your life as well. Skip to verse 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran or at Kadesh. They brought back word to them into all the congregation. They report to all 1.5 million. And showed them the fruit of the lamb. And they told them, told him, We came to the land in which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. <laughs> if, you, um, if, you, if you do some research here, the, there's some historical evidence outside of the Bible that points to the fact that what they do is, there is they walk up with a cluster of grapes that takes like six men to carry. As, as, they, as they present this fruit to Moses, that it takes like, I mean, that's a cluster, right? Like six dudes have to carry this thing. They've never even seen a grape. And so they don't know how astonishing this is. But we know how astonishing that would be. And let me just tell you this. Kelly and I, Kelly and I have been right where they were, crossed over the Jordan River, right where they crossed over, and scoped around that land some of you like some of your little beach trips and your little mountain trips, all right? When you stand on the mountain of, of Haran overlooking the, the valley of Armageddon, actually, is the valley you're out looking over, you've never seen anything so fertile. You've never felt air that is quite so crisp and quite so refreshing as the air of the promised land. You should go sometime. It's one of those places that when you walk around, you just feel good. Everybody know what I'm you're tracking? Have you, have you been to one of those places? Just when you walk around, you don't have to have anything exciting happen. It just feels good. That's the promised land. That's where they've been, full of pr provision, full of joy. Now remember, these folks have never owned anything but slavery. And also remember that this land has been promised by God. Okay? Verse 28, however, the report continues, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw descendants of Anak there. And bam, even slaves in Egypt had heard of these guys. Nine feet tall, and I'm not exaggerating. Sometimes I exaggerate, not this time. Nine feet tall, giants, giants of men, men who had a reputation that would carry across slavery lines into the hearts of these people. 
The Amalekites dwell in the land. Vicious warriors. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites, vicious warriors, dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. The report says lots of enemies. Big ones. Giants. Men that can't be defeated. Daunting ones. So the report is this. The fruit is good. The air is good. It's good. But there are difficulties, you might say. And once again, as we peer into our promised land, we will see the same. Catching a theme here, what I'm trying to get across to you? As we peer into our flourish, we will see the same. We will see great land, great fruit, great air, where we want to be, great difficulties in getting there. Verse 30, the crux of everything we're talking about here. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. I have to tell you, my deepest desire in life is to be Caleb. Let me say that again. My deepest desire in life is to be Caleb. You should want to be him too. What he has done is said, because God has promised it, it is so. Let us never fear anything or anyone, because God is great, he is glorious, he is grand, he cannot be defeated, he has guaranteed us the land. My greatest desire in life is to be Caleb, to be an encourager for you, for you to encourage others, for you to disciple people, to understand and believe the same. Verse 31, then the men who had gone up with him, what I would call the voice of less, said, we are not able to go up against the people. We are not able, underline that in your Bible, to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Uh, ironically, those same dudes watched the Red Sea open up. Watched a wall of water over here, and a wall of water over here, and they walked across a sea that you cannot see from one side to the other. It is so vast. And then watched it close up over the entire Egyptian army, destroying their enemies. They're the ones giving the report. They didn't hear about that happening. They walked across the dry land. We were prone to wonder, yes? Yes? So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land, though we have gone to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. This is an accurate report, by the way. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. People, they were so big and so strong, people believed that, that gods had had sex with women and created these, these beings. It was like they were an alien. They were actually men, but they were like uh, supernatural aliens of some kind. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. They felt so small around them, they felt like a grasshopper. And so, it's, so we seemed to them. So if you summarize that, it's difficult battles ahead. These men are not just going to walk away when they cross the river, who have been occupying this beautiful place for a long time. It's going to be really difficult. God wants us to see how difficult this will be. He is acknowledging how difficult it is because he allowed Moses to report the exact report for us. Difficult. But the land had been promised by God. Now, I'm not a prosperity teacher, but God does have prosperity in mind for his Faithful, God has promised a life better than the one we live in rebellion to him. It starts now. See, I think a lot of us think about, when we think about promised land, promised life, I'm cross, all, the, all the old uh, songs that we sing, I'm crossing over a river into a promised land. Here's what God wants you to hear tonight. Your promised land began the day that he re redeemed your heart. Jesus said to us, who are still living and breathing on earth here, not dead yet, he said, you can have a life and have it more abundantly. 
That's a promise. So how did Moses and the people respond to this? Moses confuses me in this passage. He becomes almost like Adam in the garden. He kind of like sticks his finger in his ear and walks over in a corner somewhere. He's a great leader, a great prophet, he's a, he's a, but he's not God and he's not Jesus. And so he, for some reason, slides out and does not lead. And here's what's ironic. Most folks in our culture don't think that they want to be led. A bunch of you in this room have been fighting authority your whole life. I'll never, ever be told what to do. I had a tyrant in my, earlier in my life, and I will never be told what to do. Everybody's sin nature is the same. We want to be in charge. We want to be God. We fight authority. But let's see here how the passive leadership and rebellious don't tell me what to do people, how that turns out. If you trace your life, that never has gone real well. When you are independent and rebellious and have no one to lead you or shepherd you out of that, that crashes and burns. Let's see what happens here. Because what needed to happen, as soon as Caleb and Joshua gave the good report and the ten other spies gave that negative Norris report. Anybody got like negative Norrises in your life? Like these ten spies? Say, so, hey, man, you can't go there. You can't do this. You're worthless. You mean you need a voice of less, right? What happened, needed to happen here was for the great Moses to say, pack your stuff, we're going across the river. That's not what happened. Instead of elder-led church, they had the first church congregational business meeting. Everybody, anybody ever been to a business meeting in a congregational-led church? That's what's about to happen here right now. Numbers um, 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry. And the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. As usual, it's kill the pastor, right? <laughs> the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. We always do that, right? In the name of family protection, I'll, I'm not going to go do anything. Let's not trust God. All right? They continue, would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They just had the first church vote. Let's count the votes. One million... 500,000 plus 10 politicians, oh, I mean 10 spies, just voted to go back to slavery in Egypt. They voted to go back to whips. I started to say whips and chants. started to sound like some kind of <laughs> book you should not read. To, anyway, it's a bad scene, slavery back there, making bricks 18 hours a day, right? Here's the rest of the vote count. Two spies vote, believe God, and take the land. Right? The nays have it. The nays have it. Now, that's unacceptable to Joshua and Caleb. Let's see if we can figure out where Moses is. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephaniah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes as if someone has died and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, pleading with them, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. He is pleading with them. Do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land. Listen to what he says, for they are bread for us. In other words, they're only there to, pro to pro provide us stuff when we get there. That's, how, that's confidence bordering on arrogance, right? A little cocky. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not 
fear them. That's a good, that's a good sermon right there. Then, what happens is the typical reaction, if you jack with a congregational-led church by giving them some truth that jacks with their idolatry. Okay? Here we go. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But understand this. Understand this. God will rush to the defense of his faithful. Look at the rest of that verse. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the people of Israel. They pick up stones. 1.5. All the people of St. Louis and St. Louis County. You know how many people this is? All the people of St. Louis and St. Louis County. 1.5 million people all pick up a rock. Like it's going to take that many to smash two dudes, right? And the presence and the essence of the Lord God Almighty rushes up to the tent of the meeting and goes, Not today, boys and girls. There's some other spots in Scripture where it says, touch not my anointed, and that's what happens right here. Don't play with my cats. God just got real serious. I don't know if he says cats or not. <laughs> so before you start wanting to remove God's elders over personal preference, a vote, remember that God showed up here and wanted to kill them all. What, where this goes now, I'm not going to read all this, is that God says, I'm going to start over. These 1.5 people want to kill these two guys who get that I said I will give you the land. And God says to Moses, I'm killing them all. And Moses begins to plead with God, no, God, you, you have chosen these people to reveal your glory. He starts pleading with him not to massacre 1.5 million people here. And let, me, let me tell you this, you need to wrestle with this tonight. God is a just God to kill all 1.5 million on the spot. When you get there, you believe in the God of the Bible. Because not only have they rebelled in the garden, rebelled against his love, deserved death, the penalty of that is death, now they are being disobedient in this life to his... <laughs> We're lucky he didn't kill us all. It's grace and mercy that keeps him from killing us all. You have... Here's what's happened. Let me just, this isn't in the script. This is too good. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus has taken Moses' place as your good high priest. So if God ever goes, I'm killing them all, he doesn't do that. But if he did, Jesus would rush in and go, no, you've chosen them to reveal your glory. Don't, don't, don't go in and start over. Don't go in and kill. He starts pleading with God the Father. We have a good high priest who sits at the right hand of God and pleads on our behalf. This is, Moses was just a precursor to the great high priest Jesus. Who, who desperately defends you. Desperately defends you. You know, Lance Smith, uh, elder here, says uh, it's a good thing that God and Moses never got mad at the people on the same day because sometimes Moses said, I, you know, I think we ought to just kill it. God, why don't you just kill all these people and let's start over? They don't get it. It's too good. So you need a power of prayer moment? God has said to Moses, I'm killing them all. Moses pleads with him, don't kill them. And then verse 20 says, Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. He shows grace and mercy because his dude, Moses, says, don't kill him. The one who, and it's, if you don't think God isn't merciful, the one who just stood by with his finger in his ear while Caleb is saying what needs to be said. Moses comes back to the scene and goes, don't kill him. Pleads with him in prayer and God relents and listens to him. But there is consequence. God says, I won't kill them, but they have chosen the mundane. They have chosen the common eat dust existence. And so he says this. He continues. Verse 32. But as for you, you who want to be disobedient, you who want to run your own ship, your dead body shall fall in the wilderness. And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithfulness, faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the numbers of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years. Now he sets the 40 years on them. It's in response to their disobedience. 
and you shall know my displeasure. That's a, when God says that to you, that's a bad day. And you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all the wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. And just to show that he doesn't play with rebellion, if you read on, God kills the ten pessimist spies on the spot. Oh, you want to speak against my promises? Plague. Dead. Worm meat. I will not be mocked, God says. So I say to you, in earnest wisdom, be careful of the counsel that you bring the church. When God has promised something, do not mock God and preach against his promise. Well, I think that's too difficult, too expensive, too whatever. What kind of report are we giving? Am I a voice of more, Joshua and Caleb? You know, am I a voice of left, ten worm meat, dead spies? Spirit? Flesh. Of everyone standing there, here's the way this boils down, including Moses. Of everyone standing there on that spot in that day, including Moses, no one saw the promised land but two. God has just decreed all of you that voted against me here, and you mute leader that voted against, that essentially voted against me by not leading, all will die here in this mundane dust. The good news for those folks is that he had chosen them, and he continues to provide them manna every day for the rest of their life. He continues to give them clothes that never wear out. He continues to give them a light at night and a cloud over them in the day so they don't get sunburned. His provision for them is still there. His provision may be here for you tonight. But are you in the wilderness or are you in the promised land? Which one are you dwelling in? Their sin may be forgiven. He did not strike them dead, but it does carry consequence. He says, you will die here. You will never see there. It will be almost as though you were never saved. And it's like, man, you know, like, man, it isn't quite steak. Water from a rock is not quite the best wine. God says, I will continue to feed you, to take care of you. But because of your disobedience, there will be, I know, here it comes, there will be no prosperity. In his time and for his good pleasure, God does prosper his people. See, our eternal life begins at our regeneration. And often we are just like... <laughs> see, we read that story and we go, well, those dumb Israelites, don't we? They're so dumb. What's wrong with you? And then we wake up tomorrow morning with the promises of God and we go, I think I'll stay in Egypt today. I, I know that God wants to release me from all these bondages of slavery, but I, that's hard. Those guys are big. But what, let's, get, let's get the a why out here. Why did, these, why did they do this? Why did the 1.5 million vote to go back to slavery? And the answer is really pretty simple. There were two people that believed God. What were the very first words of the first verse? God said, I will, come on. Give you the land. Two really believe. See, um, you know, faith is an interesting deal. I liken it to a small boy. You may have seen this before. There'll be a, a small boy, there'll be a daddy in the water of a swimming pool, right? And you'll have a small boy walk up to the edge of the pool, and the daddy's going, Dean, I can see you doing this, man. Like, come on, man, jump, jump, right? That boy may have faith that you'll catch him in his mind, you'll catch him in his mind, but he doesn't have faith until he what? jumps. These people can say they believed in God. They can say they believe God. But because they said, I'm not crossing the river because it's too difficult over there, they actually didn't. 
Is that where we are tonight? Is it just too hard? See, we choose slavery, and we do the same today. See, the difference between this message and the quack prosperity preachers of today is that they tell you that your personal prosperity desires can be spoken into existence. If you just have enough faith, right? Or that you can buy, actually buy it in some kind of give-to-get scheme. And here's what Jesus actually says. Listen closely. He says, let's cross the river together. Listen closely. This is the most important message of your life. He says, let's cross the river together. He says, I know that to cross the river, there's giants waiting over there for you, things that you said you would never tackle. But here's what we're going to do for my glory and for your benefit so that you can flourish in the promised land for the rest of your life. We will take those things on together. I will give you wisdom and power and authority like you never thought. Because if you read the book of Joshua, you will see them take on those giants. You'll see them take on, and these guys are, these, these former slaves are not trained for battle. They don't even have very good weapons. They, they, they take one city with some trumpets. They send in the stinking music, musicians. Never, they never have to swing a sword. Right? Because God provides the power. He says, I, I'm not sending you in to take these giants on, these difficult things by yourself. He says, let's go in together. Watch me do this. As you, listen to me. You're not going to like this. As we suffer together for my glory and your benefit. If you read the New Testament, it says that in every book of the New Testament. I suffer to receive my joy for my obedience, Jesus says. Now come with me and suffer with me as we take on these giants in the promised land so that you can flourish for the rest of your life. You're living a half a little mundane life. Does, the, does life in the desert sound fun to you? You know, um, there are things that we do that are no fun in the sand, right? I'm just throwing it out there. Jesus invites us to a completely different experience. And, and here's honestly, here's the status of this room tonight. <laughs> some of you are not going to like this. It may be too hard for some of you. Many of you in the room have already voted to go back to Egypt. And if you go back to Egypt, that doesn't mean you're going to hell. What it means is that you have said, I want mundane. I want desert living. I'm willing to accept desert living because it's not worth the cost to go into the promised land and take on the giants. So for the abuse victim, it's, I will never go back there. We'll never let anyone anywhere close, even Jesus. And then we wonder why we are so angry, why we numb with alcohol, why we don't trust anyone, why we sometimes feel no deep joy when everyone talk else talks about the joy Jesus is bringing. Some of you are in that, right? You, you hear everybody talking about this joy that Jesus brings, but you don't feel it. Here's why. You're standing on the ridge, looking into the promised land, seeing the giants it would actually take to eliminate the things in your life that would bring that joy that you can't receive, saying it's just too hard. I really don't believe that God is giving me the land. I know he's promised it, but I really don't trust him. Honestly, you voted to eat sand. You chose the mundane desert. And many of you sitting in this room have deep-seated resentments against other human beings and should They've probably hurt you, and, but quite honestly, those things define you, and they own you. And God comes to you and says, I want to heal this, but you kind of like your anger. You kind of like slavery. You kind of like living there, so you vote to go back to it. And there's some selfish cats in here. Some of you uh, want to be able to spend your money wherever you like. And God has told you that your security idol is bondage, but you don't care. It is too difficult to trust him. And he said, the land is yours. You'll never want for anything. Honestly, you can give it all away. But you say, I don't care. Porn addict. You say, I'm not willing to kind of like do the co-aversion of teen challenge away from my family so that God can purge this poison from me. It's too hard 
The giants are too big. How about for some of you, the shame and guilt of past sin? I mean, you don't understand, Tim. I can't even tell my spouse how many people I slept with. Did the club scene? I honestly don't even know. It's too much. It's too difficult. I will never go there. Yeah, but, yeah, but Romans 8, now, now no more condemnation. I don't, I don't care. You don't understand. I, Jesus can say that all he wants. I don't care. I choose slavery. Or some of us have a prideful image to uphold. Uh, I can't go to counseling. I can't admit I have a problem. I can't DNA. I can't get real honest. I just can't. I've spent my whole life building up this image of prideful reputation, and I, I can't expose myself and be real. It's too big. It's too difficult. Gutsy people. Joshua and Caleb's. Really gutsy people. Face and step into emotional pain. Take on the giants that are nine feet tall in our minds. So here's what I've done. We're going to finish with some a family meal, and we're going to finish with some meditation. Um, I'll put a list in your sermon notes of some things that keep people from crossing the river. It's by far a, from a comprehensive list. But here's what I want to tell you is that a lot of times folks choose slavery and they're not even sure what has them in bondage. So we have to go on a search. We have to go on a search for what the giants are. That's why we do DNA at this church, to give you a safe place to process this. If you're not in a DNA group, you should be. Because here's the deal. Not all 1.5 million people need to watch you deal with this. It can be just a couple. You don't have to get real and expose your life until you're ready to give like a testimony or something to what God's done as you're in the promised land now and there's been victory. You actually watched God do what he said he would do and now you can give testimony. But you don't have to walk that through with everybody. You can do it in a very small group, but you've got to bring somebody in. And tonight, the goal is just for you to bring Jesus in. Just for you to bring this great high priest in who loves you and is praying for you at this moment. See, um, the good news for you tonight is that when you go take on the giants, you don't have to take a sword. You don't have to get into a fight. Even though it's a battle, you don't have to get into a fight because Jesus already fought the fight. What you're trusting in tonight is different than what these guys trusted in. They trusted in a promise of God that was still to come. The good news for you tonight is that you get to place your faith and trust into something that has already been done. Jesus said, when you take on your giants, um, I already defeated them. When they ran nails through this hand and they ran nails through this hand, they ran nails through my feet and they run a spear up my side and that death defeated sin. And then when I came out of the tomb by the power of the Spirit, that defeated death. And if you can name any giant that's bigger than those two, I've defeated those two. And so it's done. So what I want you to do tonight is uh, see him in his glory. See him in his victory. See, what we do is we just hear about this Jesus who's kind of this ethereal thing that we're supposed to believe in so we can get eternal life, and we never really trust that what he has done has made what you're dealing with done. Are you tracking with that? And so we continue to struggle. We continue to run around in the desert in a mundane living instead of crossing over with the land of milk and honey. See, Jesus took the spear at the cross. The war has already been one, God has given us the land. It's not something for the future like it was for these guys. It is done, finished. So my question to you is this. Will you go in and prosper? Will you go in and prosper? Here's how you do that. Close your eyes. We sang beautiful Jesus. 
perfect in power, matchless in glory, beautiful Jesus. If we, whatever happens here in the next few moments, at some point I encourage you just to go celebrate his victory, beautiful Jesus' victory at the tables with bread and cup and then come back and maybe sit with a couple of the people or sit by yourself and pray. What are, I don't know how you want to walk this out, but somebody got some stuff you need to wrestle with here. Have I trusted him? Have I trusted this beautiful Jesus in all? Do I believe he's matchless in power? Is it, are the things that he can't come and touch, are they on this list? Is there something on this list that is not there? What, what is it? Let me pray for you. Father, um, by the power of your spirit, could you come and soothe hearts now? It's okay to wreck a heart, but then soothe it and say, um, all the punishment that was delivered on those 1.5 million people was set on Jesus. In this room tonight, you don't have to worry about punishment. What we need to worry about is trust. Will we believe him that he's taken the land? Will we believe in his beauty? Will we believe he's matchless in power? Will we trust him?